Welcome to Gigonomics. In this episode, I will be going over the history of the Austrian School of Economics. And to give some background of the history of Austrian economics, I want to introduce Keynesian economics or Keynesian macroeconomics more specifically, which was created by John Maynard Keynes, who was a British economist of the 19th and late 19th and 20th century and argued that economic downturns are a normal feature of the free market. Therefore, Keynes suggested that government policies, which include monetary and fiscal policies, are necessary to stabilize the economy. He said that the animal spirit in us creates a decrease in the aggregate demand and this reduces output, and as a result, we have a decrease in employment. And this all creates an economic downturn, which is a recession. But aggregation of data for macroeconomic analysis, um, as the Austrians view it, is... Uh, a moral worthless statistic. We don't look at the we. With the Austrians, we look at the individual. So the Austrian School of Economic Thought was founded by Karl Menger, who created it in 1870. And it is prominent until the present day. And so some of the features of the Austrian School of Economics is the organizing power of the market via the price mechanism. We also look at subjective evaluation and we look at the entrepreneur as the primary role. The Austrians have also developed the Austrian business cycle theory, which is the boom bust cycles and Austrians blame the boom bust cycle as the outcome of currency manipulations such as quantitative easing or the bailing out process by central planners. And the methodology that the Austrians use is deductive reasoning. The complexity of human behavior makes mathematical modeling of a market extremely difficult. And the Austrians also view that empiricism or the scientific method has a little place in Austrian economics. So, not all Austrians deny the use of empiricism completely, but it, it has only little significance. And the last point of the Austrian school of economic thought is methodological individualism, which is saying that individuals are atoma, a, a, atomistic. Um, this is saying that economic phenomena are not the expression of some social force or society. Rather, they are the result of the conduct of individuals. So that is a brief overview of the Austrian School of Economic Thought and introducing Keynesian macroeconomics. And some of the significant debates that the Austrian School has been in was the debate about methodology, which was the meth straight debate of the 1880s. This was the German historical school versus the Austrian school. Um, and they were debating the universi universality of laws. Um, and the Austrians were promoting deductive logic where the German historical school was arguing for the scientific method. And it was mainly, um, I believe... Mises and Hayek uh, that debated the German historical school. And so a little bit about the German school of economics is they use history and careful empirical analysis um, was the key source of knowledge of rumor action. They also saw that economics is culture specific and economic laws could not be generalized over time and space. And, uh, oh, excuse me, the Methenstrate debate, I, I believe, was 
debated with Carl Menger. Um, it was in the 1880s, and maybe Eugene Bombauerk, maybe Mises, uh, I'll get back to you on that, but it was Mises and Hayek that took part in the socialist calculation debate of 1920s. So, Hayek and Mises argued that without the price mechanism, social, socialism lacks a method of efficiently allocating resources. This is to say that there are distortions in the output market and the input market when you lack a price mechanism. Um, shortages and surpluses in socialist economies, essentially. Now, um, going into the specific history of the founding of the Austrian School of Economics, we trace it all the way back to 300 BC with Laozum and Taozum. Uh, Lao Tzu, um, you can check out his uh, work, the, the Way, Dao De Ching. Um, this will give you some ideas as to the key insights that Lao Tzu was making. I kind of like to think of Lao Tzu as an OG anarchist, if you will. And then, taking a leap forward, we go into the Spanish Scholastics era. This is in the 15th and 16th centuries. We have the teachings at the University of Salamanca uh, with the followers of St. Thomas Aquinas and scholasticism, and they introduced the method of deductive logic and discovered subjective evaluation. Um, they discovered economic laws. Well, uh, they didn't discover subjective evaluation. Maybe they did, but it was Karl Manger who really developed in his book Principles of Economics this idea of subjective value theory. And then uh, the the some of the economic laws that the Spanish scholastics discovered was the existence and universalist of economic laws. These are the laws of demand and supply, causes of inflation, which is a rise in the money supply, um, and consequence of a rise in the money su supply is rise in prices. They also developed the subjective nature of economic values and viewed interest as a premium for risk and time preference. Uh, I believe uh, here it says kicked out because Catholic Church viewed interest rate negatively. So I think it was, if not St. Thomas Aquinas, but maybe some of his followers that were kicked out of the Catholic Church because they viewed that, you know, understanding interest rates, you're putting profit to the business of debtors and, and creditors, and they just viewed this negatively. So, you have um, some of the, what they advocated, the Spanish classics, was establishing human nature. And these are the ideas of natural law, natural rights. And this is how we can derive the non-aggression principle. But um, for property rights, they were strong proponents of private property. And the ideas of freedom to contract with one another. And the ideas of freedom to trade and freedom to travel in all parts of the world independently. Uh, with respect to government rule, the Spanish classics wanted to put limits on legitimate rule of government. And they advocated just war on preventative defense. And they were opposed to most taxes and business regulations. So, now that we covered the first modern pre-Austrians, uh, the Spanish scholastics of the 16th century, we're going to talk about the French... Uh, oh, so the Spanish classics also included the Jesuits and Dominicans. Okay, so, now we're going to discuss the French physiocrats of the 18th century. And um, the last point I'll say about the Spanish scholastics is that Father Juan de Mariana published a book on the king. It was called On the King and the Royal Institution in 1598, uh, which is a powerful piece that I have not read yet. So, now discussing the French physiocrats of the 18th century, they 
developed the principles of natural rights and natural order. And Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, said man did not come together via somewhat arbitrary social contract. Um, or he advocated the social contract, but uh, the Austrians are saying, no, 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 this is not right. Uh, there's no social contract. Um, we're not brought together through this means. And it is said uh, that our competitive instincts may have evolved as part of humankind as a natural selfish behavior. This is one of the ideas put forth by the physiocrats. Um, some of the prominent members of the French physiocrats were Cantillon of 1680 to 1734, uh, developing independent subjects. And then Turgot of 1727 to 1781 developed the origin of money, subjective preference, and free trade. And then you have Jean-Baptiste Say, who developed economics is not about gathering of data. And Bastiat, who said that private property, who developed the ideas of private property and natural rights, limited government, to investigate what is seen and what is unseen. And he has a book, Economics, Economic and Law. And the French physiocrats uh, viewed exchanging favors as as what trade is, and said so we can benefit ourselves as well as others via trade. And they also developed the ideas of individualism and laissez faire, um, and self interest they said, was the motivating reason for each segment of the society to play its role. They also developed the ideas of private property ownership, where they viewed private property as a critical component of society's functioning. And they also developed the ideas of capital. Defended interest rate and capital formation serves a strategic function in the economy. Now, uh, getting into the Austrian economist, and again, the the title Austrian economics is not discussing the GDP of Vienna or the economic system that operates in Austria or did operate in Austria. It's specifically a reference to the founding members of the School of Economic Thought that developed this deductive method and the original uh, uh, economists were from Austria and Austrian economics was used as a derogatory term to slander the economists coming from Austria. This was because the German historical school viewed themselves as the most powerful economic school at that time and wanted to uh, put down uh, the the Austrian economist. So Karl Menger, who is the founder of the Austrian school, uh, he's the teacher, and he developed su the subjective theory of value and applied deductive reasoning. He battled with the German historical school and developed the theory of imputation. He had a student, Frederick von Weiser, who developed the ideas of opportunity cost and viewed resource prices as being derived from the expected price of the consumer good. Then you have Eugene von Bauwerk, who developed the theory of capital and interest, and the theory of time and economic process. And uh, you have some more modern theorists, like Frank Fetter, from 1863 to 1949, who was an American using the axiomatic deductive method, uh, tracing economic laws to individual human action. He had an honorary degree from my alma mater, Occidental College. Shout out, Oxy. And then we come to the most important economist of the 20th century, Ludwig von Mises, who's considered to be the dean of the Austrian School of Economics. And he introduced praxeology, which is the science of human action, and also took part in the socialist calculation debate, um, which again was about the lack of the price mechanism. Uh, Mises, along with Hayek, um, developed cyclical swings in business as a result of 
credit its expansion by government policy. And Friedrich Hayek is another prominent member who viewed the free market as a spontaneous order emerging out of a scheming chaos. And then you have Murray Rothbard, who is a student of Mises, uh, and it, it says he diverged from Mises and developed economic science within a framework. And he was the one in Man, Economy, and State to really develop the ideas of a private law society where we have the private provision of goods and services across the board. So this is the ideas of anarchy and using the economic system of capitalism, what that type of society looks like and how it operates with all the different technicalities. So that, uh, for the most part, is the brief history of the Austrian school of economics. Thank you. <laughs>